There we go, that's today's schedule. Um, please just bear with us for a couple of minutes while we get a few more people on board and then we shall begin. Anthony. Morning, Anthony, or afternoon. Hello, everyone. Good morning, or as I say, good afternoon, Eva. Good afternoon. It might have just turned 12. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're just waiting for a few more people to join and then we'll get underway. Um, do you want to, shall we uh, switch it slightly, put Dan up first or how? Dan, would you like to go first with pleasure? Uh, yes, I'm happy I, to go I, first. I, I, I think you're probably tired of listening to me. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> over to you then. And it's, and, and it's just one Dan and one Anthony today. Well, yeah, I think the other Dan's coming. Um, oh, okay, all right. Uh, but he's not here yet. That's going right. to get confusing again, isn't it? Oh, Dan yeah. one, Dan two. All right, Dan. How would you like? How long would you like to chat for? Just so I know timing on my side. Yeah, um, it's just a quick, quick one. Uh, probably 10, 15 minutes. So okay. yeah, not Perfect. too long. All right. Thanks. Okay, yeah, it's just... best to separate the two Dan's, otherwise we get get confused. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'll just switch things around, and all my stuff's gone down the bottom now. Um, right. Um, welcome everybody. We'll we'll. We'll get underway. Um, oh, there's Dan Bannon. Hang on. Let me just start again. I'll I'll, uh, I'll pop back in ten minutes if that's sure, okay. Anthony. Yeah, no problems at all. Is that Dan in? No, it's okay. Right. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this. Uh, Capital Raising Workshop. We have myself, Neil Davis from um, Exponential Events. We've been hosting uh, capital raising events in the city of London since 2017. Obviously over the last 18 months plus we've been virtual. Uh, we do three events a month. We do a, uh, this capital raising workshop. We do a practice your pitch event before you want to actually pitch to, uh, to our final events, which are actual uh, pitching events to angel investors, funds, um, people looking at the investment opportunities in, in new and exciting companies. So without any further ado at the moment, I will introduce you to uh, Dan from Foresters, who are our IP partners, who will explain the importance of trademarks, um, patent protection and such like, as far as uh, your ideas go going forward and how important those can be uh, for potential investors as well. So I'd like to introduce you to Dan. Dan, please share your screen and carry on and I'll let people in as we go along. Okay, thanks, Neil. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, my name's Dan Rosby Gale. I'm from Foresters. I'm a, a patent attorney um, and I will just share my screen. It's, it's quite a, a quick presentation, 10 or 15 minutes. Um, and uh, yeah, there's quite a lot in here, but um, Feel free to put any questions in the chat box um, or I'd be happy to ask, answer any questions afterwards. So um, yeah, I'll just share my screen now. Oops. Um, right. Okay. Right. <laughs> Okay, yeah, so welcome everybody. Um, oh, let's kick off. So I'm going to be talking to you today about uh, different forms of IP and I'll be focusing on the three main ones, patents, trademarks and designs. Um, there's a few other forms of IP here, which I won't talk about today, but uh, copyright, trade secrets um, and various other IP rights relating to plants and databases and that kind of thing. Um, but I'll be just looking at patents, trademarks, and designs. So let's look at some case studies. Kicking off with trademarks. Um, so a trademark is uh, used to protect your brand and um, a registered trademark can protect your company name, product name, um, slogans, logos, graphics, colors, um, all that kind of thing. Um, all, all different manner of 
your, your brand and how you represent yourself in the marketplace. Um, if you're an, an early stage startup, you may be thinking, what am I going to call my company or my, my products? Um, and uh, my advice, if you, if you want to improve your chances of being able to register your mark and get protection for your, your brand, um, it's, it's a good idea to choose um, a name which is distinctive, i.e. it's different from other names, um, and that it's not descriptive of the goods or services that you're, you're offering. So, um, for example, uh, in the case of if you're making an ice cream product, um, it's, it's unlikely you'd be able to register cool and creamy, for instance, for ice cream, because that's describing your ice cream. So, um, yeah, you, you, you wouldn't be able to protect that. So, um, yeah, and the good thing about trademark protection is uh, the protection can last indefinitely forever, um, provided you pay renewal fees, uh, usually every 10 years. Now, registered designs. Um, you can use a registered design to protect the, uh, the appearance of the whole or part of a product. Um, it's pretty easy to get registered design protection. Um, the requirements are the design must be novel, i.e. a new design, and it must have individual character. Um, and the test for that is, does it create a different overall impression on a user to designs that have gone before? Um, Again, the, the, the hurdle's pretty low here. It's, it's easy to get registered design protection um, and it will protect your design for up to 25 years um, if you pay a re renewal fee every five years. Um, here are a few examples of what you could register. So uh, yeah, packaging, products, sets of products, parts of products, um, basically the, lo the look of something that you're producing. And you can also register your logo um, and computer icons, uh, graphical user interfaces, that kind of thing, uh, if you're running a website. Moving on to patents. Now, um, a patent protects, uh, it protects a technical solution to a, a technical problem. And um, a patent is, is really your deal with the government in return for you getting 20 years monopoly to stop others from using your invention. Um, you, uh, you must disclose your invention to the public in your patent application. So, so that's your, your, your deal, if you like, to get your protection. Um, and you can protect your invention for up to 20, 20 years um, if you pay a renewal fee every, every year. Uh, and the, yeah, the hurdle for getting a patent is, is pretty high. Um, the invention must be novel in the sense that it's not uh, known already anywhere in the world. Um, and the invention must be inventive in the sense that it's not an obvious combination of what's gone before. Uh, and also the invention mustn't be excluded from patentability. Um, there's ver various exclusions such as medical treatments, mathematical methods, uh, business methods. Uh, that kind of thing. So um, yeah, my job as a patent attorney would be to steer around these exclusions from patentability um, and get get the patent patent protection in place for for your technology. And the process runs like this. Uh, you file your initial priority application to get your flag in the sand. Um, this is your the filing date and this is the date from which your protection will run. And um, I usually recommend filing in the UK first, um, since it's relatively cheap, there's low official fees, um, and you get a search report back quickly from the, the UK Patent Office in uh, within three, three to four months. Um, and the search report will give you a good indication about whether you're going to get a patent and uh, what the scope of that patent uh, might look like. And then, um, so yeah, presumably, if you're not just interested in the UK, um, most companies want, want worldwide protection um, or protection in more likely in the, the key markets where they're operating. Um, and the procedure for doing that would be to file in the UK first and then within 12 months, uh, you can file an international patent application. Um, this doesn't mature into a, an international patent. So there's, there's no such thing, unfortunately. Um, the international patent application keeps the door open for you to apply for patents later, um, 18 months later, in, uh, in the countries where you want protection. So uh, Europe, US, Japan, um, Australia, wh whatever, um, you need a patent in each country where, where you want protection. 
So that's a quick run through of the process. Um, and here's an example. So yeah, here's an old looking iPhone. Um, there's many, many different forms of IP here. Um, obviously Apple and iPhone are registered trademarks. Um, there's all manner of patents on the technology in the, in the, in the iPhone, um, all the way from, you know, the physical casing down to the, uh, you know, the way that it functions, the, the, uh, the radio communication aspect, all that kind of thing, hundreds of patents in there. Um, Apple will hold some trade secrets back that they don't want to divulge to anyone else. Um, they don't have protection for those. Um, they just choose to keep that technology secret. Uh, the, re the appearance of the phone will be registered as a, as a design, uh, as well as the graphical user interface um, provides protection for the appearance. Um, and the, the, the software itself that, that's running on the phone will be protected automatically by copyright. Um, yeah, copyright subsists automatically in, in the code. You don't need to do anything to register that. Um, although I would mention copyright protection is, is pretty narrow and can be easily avoided by um, somebody just rewriting the code. Um, so moving on now. Now, what do your investors want to see? First of all, uh, are you likely to get sued by someone else who, who already has IP protection in place? Um, and to investigate this, you can do a, a freedom to operate assessment um, and look at your, um, you can identify your competitors and look at their I, IP portfolios, work out whether you're going to well, work out the risk of you infringing somebody else's uh, IP protection. Um, secondly, have you protected what you're doing and how have you protected it? Do you have an, an IP strategy in place, um, which involves identifying the IP in your business, um, putting together the initial IP filings, patents, trademarks, registered designs, um, get your search reports for the patents uh, and trademarks, um, and then put together a pipeline uh, to work out how you're going to protect your, your IP going forward as your business grows. And uh, thirdly, I should mention patent box. Um, so if you're, if you're a UK company um, or if you uh, pay tax in the UK, corporation tax, um, the, the patent box is a government run scheme uh, which enables you to reduce your corporation tax payments on profits derived from a, a patented invention in, in the UK um, from I think it's 19% down to 10%. And these are, um, these are uh, worldwide profits made on a, uh, an invention which is patented in the UK. So um, yeah, it can, it can be a significant uh, corporation tax saving for your business um, if and when you, you start paying corporation tax. So um, yeah, quick, quick sales pitch. How, how can Foresters assist you uh, as a startup? So we, we do free 30-minute uh, consultations um, either in person at our offices or, or by video at the moment. Um, we can look at, uh, we can talk through your business and work out what IP you have and uh, what might be protectable. Um, we can do uh, an IP audit for your business uh, and uh, put together an IP strategy and a roadmap for, um, for achieving your IP filing milestones. And um, yeah, we can help you write the IP section of any investment pitch documents. We can give fi fixed price quotes for filing various IP rights. And um, we could also look at your competitors and do a, a, a patent landscape and work out whether you've got um, freedom to operate, whether you can uh, carry on without infringing someone else's rights. And uh, yeah, we've got a pretty wide team from uh, life sciences. I, I'm in the technology and engineering side um, to do with electronics and software. Um, we've got a trademark team as well to, uh, for brand protection. And yeah, I'll just finish with this. Um, this is a sort of success story. Um, we, we had a chap come into our offices. He'd invented this tool in his, uh, in his garden shed, um, quite literally. Uh, it, it's a tool for marking um, a cross on, on a wall if you're putting up a cabinet. Um, this is a, there's a great demand for this in the building trade, apparently. Um, and his invention was was this 
what's called a burst marker, which sprays a cross of chalk on the on the wall behind the cabinet where you're um, wanting to drill your hole. So you can hold the cabinet up on the on the wall and drill, you know, mark out the hole. Um, and yeah, so we did a background search to to see if there was anything similar out there. Um, turned out there wasn't. Um, we then drafted and filed a UK patent application, got that granted, and uh, we. Um, filed an international patent application as well. And he nationalized that in each country where uh, he wanted protection. Um, I think it was uh, US, Europe and China where he was producing. We registered Marksman as the trademark um, for his business. And uh, we helped him with his paperwork for Dragon's Den. Uh, he he went, went on Dragon's Den and um, all five uh, dragons offered to invest. Uh, and off the back of that exposure, sales rocketed, and you can now buy this thing in uh, in all uh, almost all DIY stores across the UK. So, yeah, so a quick example of how your IP protection can can really help uh, grow your business. So, uh, yeah, thank you very much. That's all I was going to say um, with this. Um, if anyone's got any questions, um, I'll stop sharing my screen. Um, yeah, hi Dan. There's a couple of questions in the um, ah, in yeah. the chat for you there. Okay, thanks. So, are the costs of registering a trademark and IP tax deductible? I cannot answer that question, I'm afraid, because um, I'm not able to give tax advice. Um, perhaps that's one for for Anthony or one of the uh, investment teams, um, unless you know the answer, Neil. Uh, I don't. I would no. have thought that they, as a, it would be a business expense. So probably. That's my thought as well. But uh, yeah, ch check with an accountant. Um, so second question uh, regarding patents. With products, pres it's presumably sensible to get a patent. Um, uh, my answer to that is uh, yes, it is sensible if if you if you want to be able to stop somebody else. Um, making or selling or using your product um, uh, and if possible to protect to protect against lower cost chinese or similar india south korea nicking your idea and undercutting you on price yes absolutely right so yeah it's if you get a patent over here in europe or the or the states um yeah if you have the protection over here this will enable you to stop um cheap imports coming into the market in europe and the states um so absolutely a good idea. If the products, are, you know, the core of your business, then you know it's pretty critical to get the, get get it protected. Um, so yeah. So second part of the question: If you do get this protection, um, does uh, does this just stop a Chinese company from selling the same thing in the UK uh, or anywhere you sell your product where you have a patent? So yes, yes, the patent stops the Chinese company from importing into the UK and selling in the UK. Um, and this would also, the patent would also en enable you to stop uh, any imports coming into the UK, uh, which may more likely be sold by a local seller in the UK, but produced by uh, this knockoff company in, in China. So if someone breaches the patent terms, is it up to you to sue them? expensive or does the relevant patent authority help great question um it's is absolutely up to you. you you must police your patent uh protection and stop others identify infringers and then take the necessary action against those infringers um yes it is very expensive to litigate a patent uh, very few patents are actually ever litigated uh, it has to be a pretty high value uh, high value case in order to go ahead with litigation. So uh, mostly um, infringements are dealt with through letters before action and uh, reaching a settlement. So last question here. Um, do you need patents or copyright for work systems or procedures in a surface service company? Okay. Um, so my first thought is this kind of thing would be classed as a business method if it's um, the way a business is running um, 
So it's very difficult or impossible to get patent protect, pr protection for such a thing. Um, you can patent a process, um, but the process must, um, must produce a technical effect and it must solve a technical problem in a technical way. So um, for instance, it could be an improved manufacturing process for, um, I don't know, producing um, some piece of technology more quickly or more efficiently. That, that would be patentable, but um, if it's if it's in terms of how you're running your business, then then it's not pat not patentable, and also copyright doesn't apply. Okay, that's all the questions in the chat box. There, um, I will I'll hang around and I'll pop my email in the box um, chat box. So if anyone's got any further questions, feel free to put them in the chat box or drop me an email. I'd be happy to answer those. So um, yeah, that's it from me. I'll hand back to Neil and then over to Anthony. And thank you very much indeed. Um, we'll move on. And again, we've, we've got a chat, chat box open. So if anybody's got any questions they want to pop in the chat during the um, presentations, please do so. We will open up later on as well if, if you want to ask any direct um, questions um, after we've all finished. So without any further ado, I shall hand you over to Anthony Rose, who is the um, CEO and co-founder of Seed Legals. Anthony, welcome. Good day. Hello, everyone. I've got the mic working. Excellent. We're good. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to talk about uh, the most important things for your uh, funding round, getting investment ready and for the round. So can I ask if uh, anyone wants to turn on video, uh, just uh, uh, tell me uh, for maybe a couple of people where you are so far in uh, your first uh, round or later so that I can talk to the very uh, exact things that you're looking for. So if anyone would like to turn on video and uh, say hello uh, and, and help me pitch uh, correctly. All right, no, uh, nothing from anyone. Sean, Sean, hello, Sean. You're on mute, Sean. Aha, that's better. Technology, right. Um, so where I am is really early stage, super early stage, uh, pre-MVP. Um, and that's what I'm looking at to get in this one. Okay, and uh, how much are you looking to raise? Have you thought about that? Or are you, are you looking to, to figure that out uh, now? We get to okay. All right, okay. And where's the accent from? Cape Town. Okay, me too. All right, there we go. You see, kindred spirits already. Excellent. All right, so, so you can uh, mute again, uh, Sean, and I think then I've got some uh, good prep to go with. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through, and I've called the, the 10 things to get investment ready, value your company, and, uh, and, and get investment. So with that in mind, let me start by sharing uh, my screen. Um, and by the way, there should be a little slider that you see that you can probably move around to get bigger video of me and smaller screen or the other way around. So the first thing is if you haven't yet incorporated, when you do incorporate, to uh, create ordinary shares. So sometimes when we see companies, uh, very rarely, the vast majority of companies, when you start your company on company's house, you'll make 100 shares of a pound each or a penny each. And that's the standard formula in the UK. But sometimes founders read about Mark Zuckerberg and his special shares and so on. Um, and, and they think they'll make what are called alphabet shares, A ordinary, B ordinary, C ordinary, D ordinary, or shares for founders with multiple votes per share so that they don't feel that they're going to lose control later. The problem is 100% of the time we see founders do this, it needs to get undone later. And so we find that uh, investors, when they come along, they see many, many companies coming to them for investment. And if they see one company where the founders are doing things to disadvantage the investors, it's just too much friction. So my strong advice is avoid that. When you get to an IPO stage, you can restructure things. But in the meantime, if you try and set things up with these complicated share structures, they just end up needing to be undone. So the next thing is, when you incorporate, 
you normally start with, as I said, maybe 100 shares split between the founders. And now you want to start hiring team members. And you want to, in the early days, you don't have much money. So you want to give maybe less money or even no money initially, and you want to give some shares or equity instead. And so here's a nice rule of thumb, which is if the shares have no value, you can give people shares. But once the shares have a value or are about to have a value, then if you give an employee shares, they then have a tax liability and the company can have a tax liability as if it was a, a payment you were making. So if you're paying the person, you have to pay payroll and national insurance and pension and so on. And if the shares have a value, you may find HMRC deem it as if it's a salary and it becomes an expensive mistake. So the rule of thumb is early joining co-founders uh, well before first funding round, you can give shares. But afterwards, you'd create an option pool and you would give people share options instead. And you'd create uh, an, e an option scheme, usually an EMI scheme, that makes it very tax efficient for the company and the employee. So talking of options, when you now want to give options to people, three things are needed. Number one, let's say that you've uh, close to your first funding round or you've raised your first round and you now want to start incentivizing your team with share options. So the question is how many options to give them and what size pool do you need to do? But basically three things are needed to give options to team members. Number one, when you employ them as an employee or an advisor or a consultant, you can have an agreement that promises them some number of options. And in the same way, you don't pay people their entire annual salary on day one, you pay them over months based on their doing work. Likewise, when giving someone share options, you always want to give it according to a vesting schedule. So they're gonna vest over one year or three years. So, Let's take the example of uh, an employee who joins. And let's say, you know, Sean, early on, you haven't raised much investment or you have uh, raised a small amount of investment and you can't yet pay somebody market salary. So let's say you're hiring a developer and they would on the open market get 50K a year, but they've come to join your amazing early stage startup and you can only pay them 30K a year. The difference is 20K a year. And now you might say, we will give you share options to reflect that difference. And let's say you want the options to vest over three years. So that's 60K in options. And let's say your company has a valuation of a million pounds. So that might be 60,000 over a million, which is what, 6% or something like that, uh, in options that you would give vesting over three years. And that might be appropriate for a super early stage CTO or something like that, a founding employee, because you can't keep giving away 6% or you'll be out of equity yourself pretty quickly. But that's reflecting the gap between what you can afford to pay somebody and uh, their market rate. But once you've raised investment, you'll fairly soon find that you're going to have to pay people market rates, in which case the options might be a nice discretionary add-on, and you might give people more like 0.1 or 0.5% in options. So, but in all cases, what I like to do is think about options as being an equivalent value. So you might, if you're giving, if your valuation was a million pounds, and you were to give someone uh, 10,000 pounds in share options at your current valuation, that would be like 1%. So think of it as a number. It's easier to work out than an arbitrary figure. The second thing you need to do to give people options, apart from an agreement promising them options with vesting, is to create a share option pool. So what is an option pool? It's just like a reservation. You don't send anything to company's house. You're not issuing anything. It's in your cap table. You're saying, I've got 100 shares and a reserve pool to issue 10 more later. And by creating that pool, it dilutes all the existing shareholders. So when you do your funding round, 
your investors are going to go, hey, I'm investing for 5% in your business. I don't want you to dilute me right afterwards by creating this option pool. I want you to create it beforehand so the founders dilute themselves and the investors don't get diluted. And I hope I'm not too being too complicated, but it means that when you create your funding round, you're going to create what's called a pre-money option pool as part of your round. So that was thing number two. And that's a one-click thing when you do your round on seed legals. Thing number three is at some point later, you're going to want to create an EMI option scheme for employees or what's called an unapproved scheme for advisors and consultants. It's unapproved, not because it's illegal, but just the EMI one, you agree a valuation with HMRC, which you can do on seed legals, that helps the employee and the company minimize taxes for that. For anyone who's not an employee, you don't agree a valuation with HMRC, that's the unapproved piece. You just decide what they'll pay when they exercise their options. And the person will be responsible for their own taxes afterwards, just like any other advisor. And you can do their option schemes on seed legals as well, of course. So the next thing then is your SEIS. So in the UK, there's an amazing angel investment startup ecosystem. And the vast majority of early stage rounds are angel investors, individuals investing in companies. They might be investing 2,000 pounds, 20,000 pounds, 50,000 pounds. And they're generally looking for their tax deductions. So SEIS and EIS is a fantastic initiative from HMRC to say that for SEIS, you can deduct 50% of your investment in this tax year or the previous tax year. And if you keep your shares for three years, you pay no taxes. And if the company goes out of business, you can write off your investment. So 80% of all early stage rounds, let's say up to 500,000 pound rounds, are fueled by angel investors looking for their uh, tax deductions. And here, there's something called advanced assurance. Now, advanced assurance isn't legally required, but it's something most investors will ask for. And what is advanced assurance? It's when you write to HMRC before your funding round to get a letter back from HMRC to say that you will qualify and you can offer this to investors. It's only a comfort letter for investors. They really get their tax deductions when you do what's called SEIS compliance after the funding round and they get their SEIS 3, it's called certificates that let them go off to their accountants and claim the deduction. But to know that they're gonna get that, they'd like some reassurance usually beforehand and that's where advanced assurance comes in. And you can also do this on seed legal super easily. We think one in five of all advanced assurance applications in the UK is now done on seed legals and HMRC are now responding really quickly in a week or two typically. So it's something that's quick and efficient to do and generally worth doing ahead of talking to your investors because it's often the difference between love what you're doing, call me when you've got your advance assurance, or great, I'm in. Now, there's one wrinkle, which is that because of the number of people writing to HMRC asking for advance assurance, they've been slowly increasing the bar on what is needed. And these days, you now need to provide evidence of intended investors. So they don't need to be committed. Their investment might be conditional on your getting advance assurance. But if you're looking to apply for, let's say, £200,000 of advance assurance to say, investors, I can raise it, offer you at least £200,000, then you need to provide HMRC with intended investors of at least around 25% of that amount. So you have to find some intended investors before you can do your application. But again, they don't have to invest. But because it's HMRC, you don't want to make anything up. They need to have people who plausibly likely invest if all things work out. So now you've got your advance assurance. The next thing is to work out how much you want to raise and what your valuation might be. So let's start with the valuation. So there you are, Sean. You've you know, got a prototype. You're busy working on it. 
how are you going to pick your valuation? You know, is it a made up number? And you've got two problems. One, to pick a valuation and two, to be able to justify your, to your investors. Because if they go, how did you pick two million pounds? You go, well, you know, I, I, I read an article. It sounded like a good idea. You know, you, you need a bit more than that. So there are a few things you can do. You can read TechCrunch. And those are crazy US numbers. So you should take at least one zero off the end because they're just not the same in the UK. You can read UK tech news or other publications that list how much companies have raised. But there, lots of companies will say how much they've raised, but it's very rare that people say their valuation. So that's probably no good. The next thing is you can go to your accountant and you can say, what's my valuation? And your accountant will say, Hey, Sean, have you got revenue? You go, no. And they'll go, uh, have you got revenue coming up real time soon? And you'll go, not really, no. And they're going to go, are you losing money? And you go, oh, yes, that's why I need to raise money because I'm spending it. And they'll go, well, according to the books, you know, you not only have a valuation of zero, but you're probably not a going concern. So that's no good at all. So what is the solution? And the solution is, really based on data. So on Seed Legals, looking at thousands of funding rounds, what we found is that companies sell a median of 15% equity in a round. So this would mean if you are raising, let's say 150,000 pounds, which is your standard SEIS funding round in the UK, at an 850,000 pound pre-money valuation, this would mean that after your round, your valuation would now be 850K plus the 150 you've raised, a million pounds. Your investors would own 150,000 pounds out of the million, which is 15% of the company. And therefore, that is your 15% dilution. So 850,000 pounds is roughly five times 150,000, or it is five times. So in fact, what we see from the data is your valuation in general is basically five times the amount that you want to raise. And valuations in the UK fall into a few bands. So somewhat facetiously, it goes like this. A couple of founders get together, have a PowerPoint presentation. Well, really no one invests on a PowerPoint. So founders start by putting we see 26,000 pounds of their own money into the business to create a prototype, some working code, something investable. And then they might raise 50,000 pounds as a bootstrap or friends and family round. And then they might raise 150,000 pounds as an angel round. And then they might raise, once they've launched and have some people using it, maybe then they'll do a seed round raising 500,000 pounds perhaps. And then once they've got revenue and maybe 50,000 pounds month revenue or even 20,000 pounds a month recurring revenue, you might now do a series A round raising a couple of million pounds. And your goal as you grow your company is to raise money maybe three times such that each time you're going to sell 15% of the business and creates 10% option pool at the beginning. So that after three funding rounds, the founders are now either don't need to raise more because the business is profitable, or you're ready to sell your business and everyone makes a great return. And if you do three funding rounds, each time diluting 15% with a 10% option pool, after those three rounds, the founders still have more than 50% equity. So the numbers, work out well. And each round, your goal is to raise three to five times the amount of the last round at three to five times the valuation. And if you keep that as a sort of mental mind map, that's a great way to chart the goals for your business. So everything I've shown is about how to value the company. And by the way, on this, because there's quite a lot of information there, head over to Seed Legal's resources deal data where there's a very nice article on all the things I've just mentioned and more on valuing the company and how much equity dilution to set in a round. And that's really your valuation versus the amount you want to raise. But wait, there's more. 
So once upon a time, people had to do funding rounds uh, and they were very complicated. You spend months finding investors and then you spend months on the legals and it was super expensive. And then of course you want to do it all over again, but you can't raise more right after. You have to have traction and growth and that takes at least six months. And you can't risk trading insolvency. So you need at least three months cash in the bank. And that turned into the sort of 12 to 18 month, you know, go big or go home cycle. And it's immensely stressful. But what if there was another way? And so now with Seed Legals, we are really talking about agile fundraising. And what this means is, let's say that you had in mind that you wanted to raise 200,000 pounds. So there are broadly three options. Number one, magically, you've got 200K of investors lined up. Amazing, do a funding round, which you of course can do on Seed Legals. Scenario number two, is you've got a hundred thousand pounds lined up. And once upon a time, you had to decide, do I close a hundred K round or do I wait longer and try to raise all 200 K? But these days you can do a rolling close round. So you can say, I'm just gonna close my hundred K and then I'm gonna top up another hundred K when I find those investors. And that's a rolling close round, which is now one click option on Seed Legals. But the other scenario is somebody comes along and goes, hey, Sean, I love what you're doing. I'd like to invest 20K. 20K is too small to be a funding round. So what to do? You don't want to say, come back in December or September, because actually you really need the money now. You didn't need 200K now. You actually needed 20K to pay your developer or your UX or whatever it might be. So what you want to do is you'd like to find a way to say, I'll take the 20K now and I will give you shares later at a valuation to be determined later when I do my round. And the answer to that is called a seed fast. So seed fast are insanely popular. It's an SEIS, EIS compatible way of an investor giving you money now that will convert into shares later when you do a funding round later. So you can hop on Seed Legals, I'll stop sharing now. And we call that agile fundraising. And it has really changed the way companies in the UK raise investment. The, you know, there's probably more investment raised out of a round than in a round now. So if you've got any questions, it's anthony at seedlegals.com, drop me a note or head over to the Seed Legals website, hit the chat bubble and everything to do with fundraising or you know, founder questions or team employment agreements we're there to help with thank you very much anthony thanks very much indeed does anybody have any questions they, they want to ask anthony now or we'll put in the chat if you're shy <laughs> oh here we go all right so sarup great question what's the downside of agile fundraising it's a good point so once upon a time investors sort of took it as a failure to complete your round that you needed to raise in dribs and drabs. So they would say that, you know, if it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger in a sense. Uh, so if you said you want to raise 200K, then they would want to see that you've raised the entire 200K. And in a sense, what was driving that is the investor, one of the fears for the investor, of course, is your company's not going to have people using or buying its products and it's going to run out of money but another fear is that they say great i'll invest and it turns out they're the only idiots investing no one else was investing and you've told them you needed 200k to build your business to get to launch they put in their 20k and you run out of money because they've given you their 20k so often in the past and to an extent today investors will say i'm only going to invest if i see everyone else investing and you filling out your round and failure to get to your round target was seen as a failure but i think that's wrong and i think we've been working to change that perception because literally you didn't need to raise 18 months of investment today at uh, you know, today's valuation, when in a year's time, your valuation will be three times that. So you're giving away way more equity. So what if you could change it? And instead of being a sort of failure to reach 
the, the round target, you could explain to the investors, it'd be great if I got 200K in the bank today, but actually it's much more efficient that I have 20K so I can get on with my uh, you know, bills rather than twiddling my thumbs, spending the next few months on the road looking for investors. And, and by the way, in return for your investing earlier and potentially taking a bit more risk, I will give you a 10 or 20% discount compared to what the investors in my round will pay later. So you turn it into a win-win for the company to get some money in earlier and for the investor to get rewarded for coming in. And actually the data shows that works very well because the majority of rounds these days have people either raising before the round with seed fast and or doing a rolling close round. And I think the perception from investors is rapidly changed to embrace that. All right, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Then I guess we're on to Dan. Dan number two. All right, thanks. And hello, Dan. Hi, Anthony. I didn't know you were South African, eh? Live and learn. Um, okay, so let's have a quick uh, chat about. So, do we want to get people to turn their cameras on? To have yeah, we can, uh, if 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 they'd like to, yeah, please. I mean, we're we're here to help everybody, so please, you know, make the most of this. So, <clears throat> so it might be quite good to talk a little bit about where all this money is coming from, because I think it helps if you know where the money is coming from. It kind of helps you with your negotiation at the end of the day. So um, do any of the uh, startups out there have an idea where, you know, understand the flow of money, where it's coming from? Okay, so um, so typically your, uh, your money is gonna come from, so typically you guys will be looking from angel investors, okay? Your angel investors are, um, but before that, I would consider you look at your, fa your, your family, family and friends, or even better, your profitable customers. Um, to answer um, Saruk's question in terms of, uh, to give him another answer, there possibly is one downside. If you start taking equity, because equity is not for everyone. Um, if you start taking equity, you're gonna be diluting your proposition. So you'll be, uh, you know, might have a very successful slice of a pie, but you might not necessarily have all the pie, not necessarily a bad thing. So. Um, but something to bear in mind that you're going to be diluting your, the ownership of your business. It's also worth noting that getting equity is a lot of hard work as well. If you've got profitable customers who you can then self, who you can fund your business, that might be the better option, but it's, it's very hard and it's not very easy, particularly in the tech world. And getting equity is typically seen as one of the main ways to do it. Uh, another way might be to consider debt, to take on a debt, to go to the bank. There's quite a lot of money at the moment, though, in the equity scene. You've got uh, the British uh, Business Bank, for instance, which has pumped about two billion pounds worth of extra capital into the system. So there's like 1,200 new business uh, businesses which have taken drawn down from that funding. So there's a really lot of funding. One of the things to understand is your money typically, the money further down in the seeds in the Series A and B stage and everything else is going to be in the uh, come from the venture capital side. And they get their money from pensions. And what you must understand is they come with requirement. They get their, their, their the pensions, the, the limited partners or general partners, but typically limited, put on constraints on the venture capital company to uh, in terms of where this, uh, in terms of what they can invest in. Maybe green tech, it may be a uh, tax benefit, such that it follows EIS. It may be that it helps a regional economy, for instance. So often when you go to a, a VC and they say, sorry, we're not, you know, we don't kind of, you don't really fit our kind of investment. They've got no, they're, they're really, their hands are tied. So really look really carefully when you select doing your investment strategy <clears throat> in terms of making sure you've got your tax benefits rights, your SEIS and EIS, because that's like <clears throat> a massive um, uh, tax benefit and it's really a requirement that many of the angel investors will be looking for these days. Um, make sure that the investors you go and approach, they haven't invested in similar things because they don't want a conflict of interest. Um, but it, nonetheless, it's the kind of thing that they're interested in and more than anything else, make sure they've got the money. 
that a lot of people spend a lot of time with angel investors who say, yeah, I got 10 million pounds and everything else. And you know, I can hustle that up. And it, it's either a lot of hot air or it's going to be very hard to come by. Don't spend six months dedicating all your time to one individual angel investor who turns out to be a fraud. Check their history, check who else they've invested in, feel the rights. You should feel as if you should be able to interview uh, it, them and build a relationship with them just like they should be checking you out as well. So um, for the, those that are on the call, um, it'd be quite good to get a little idea where what stage you're at at the end of the day understand if you're in the difference between um, seed funds and angel syndicates and those kind of things. Yeah, there's a question there down from Saroop. Hi, Saroop. I think I've missed. Uh, where's the best way to find, find angel? Um, so find them as in find their details or find them as in where do I meet them in a, a you know, in a where do they hang out at night? Uh, I'll answer that. I mean, uh, I guess, um, yeah, I mean, kind of, I guess everybody's got networks. Um, I'm kind of quite linked with the IOD. Um, but um, it doesn't mean you'll find angels in the IOD. I'm sure you'll find a few. But, um, uh, I mean... You'll find angels in the IOD. I think the, I I the IOD might even have their own angel syndicate. Yeah, I'm not. I I haven't come across one um, to date, but um, yeah, I mean, if um, you know, if you're kind of like advising a, a typical startup um, who's, who's looking for funding in a whatever space, how, how would you kind of say suggest that they look for angels in that space? So. So most angel invest most most, right, most VCs the details are pretty clear and available on the on 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 F Success and various other websites at the end of the day and angel investors as well. But typically, the best way to get hold in touch with an investor is to get referred. So get a referral from so another from an, a startup they've already invested in who goes, hey, this guy this guy Sarup, he's got a really great idea. They'll pay attention. To somewhat to the, the startups they invest in, um, or they've been recommend, or, or it's a startup that's exited, so it might be a business. They'll be pay attention to that. The number of cold calls they get is extremely high, and actually, that doesn't really get paid. And and you might cut through at the end of the day with a compelling proposition and a competitive deck, like has been rehearsed on the pitch deck on Neil's event yesterday, for instance. But you're going in with one hand behind your back than if you can get go through with a recommendation from someone that's yeah. going to get their attention. I think, sorry, just to interrupt there, Dan. Uh, sorry, the, there's no single answer to this question. I'm not being a politician here. There isn't. Um, it's a question of what has been for the last 18 months or so, uh, uh, doing as many virtual events as you could possibly can to get in front of potential investors. Now, that obviously costs money and, again, that's part of the capital raising um, scenario is it does actually cost money to raise money. Um, not necessarily huge amounts, but um, it certainly does. Now with things opening up again a little bit more, you wanna be looking at, uh, for example, if I, if I was raising something, I'd, I'd have a teaser, I'd send it to my LinkedIn network. I'd ask my friends uh, to share it with their network to see what sort of interest you can generate and start conversations. Um, attend networking events. They don't necessarily have to be summer focused. Obviously, there's no point if you're in the leisure industry attending a health uh, networking event necessarily. Having said that, it doesn't mean that certain investors won't invest in, in different things. Uh, that there's, it's very difficult to define and get a complete narrow down of exactly what an investor will, will invest in. For example, we've got our, which we're just launching, the Exponential Club, whereby we're going to have directories or for members of searchable investors, funds, etc., in different sectors. But it doesn't mean that they won't invest in your leisure company, for example, um, if they like it. So, again, it's it's push out as many 
avenues and information to as many avenues as you can. And I think Dan made a very uh, valid point there. Once you've got one investor who's interested and or is even investing, human nature dictates that they're going to talk to their friends and their friends are going to be of similar ilk to them as well because they want to see the thing work and they want you to raise the money uh, to get on with what you're doing. And I'd say a very high percentage of companies that we've raised money for uh, who've been introduced from an investor from one of our events have then uh, gone on to introduce uh, their friends to a particular company. We had we had one, I think it was one of the last events we held back in, oh, no, it would have been the end of last the year before, um, where a company presented, one of our guys became a founding investor uh, and I went to have lunch with a mate of mine who knows this guy as well and who was sitting at the table as well was the founder of this company. So it introduced him to um, to this particular person. So that works very well. It's, again, it, it's just, it is, a, it, and I know Dan will go on about this as well. It is a job raising money um, and it's not an easy one. But Thanks. again, it's like anything, neither is running a business. You, you've got to just, <laughs> you've got to find as many possible avenues as you can. Yeah. What does your business do, sir? Well, um, it, it's actually not um, my business. I just come across a lot of kind of people who um, are kind of like starting up and they're, um, you know, wanting to raise funds. And, um, you know, I, I kind of say, well, I'll kind of introduce you to people in my network, but, um, you know, that's, there's so much I can do. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, the other, the other thing, I guess, what kind um, of business? I'm not sure. But there are different kinds of business. So one is like um, healthcare business in terms of um, uh, VR training um, uh, for medical uh, staff, medical personnel. But they also do things like um, uh, fire kind of training, uh, uh, kind of fire uh, martial training. So they can do anything basically, so long as um, you know you pay the the cost of actually setting up the module, um, and it can be interactive in terms of it can it can kind of give you a test at the end of the uh, the training session. Um, so that's one of them. Um, I, I mean, the other question I had was in terms of uh, kind of reaching out to try and. Uh, crowdfund as opposed to kind of looking yep. for angel investors. Um, and I guess I mean, my... one of the things worth remembering is that as your business grows and develops and becomes this over the years, uh, in the future, you, one of your main tasks will be managing your investors. Yep. And if you've got a, yep. a lot of them, it becomes a lot more painful. So, yep. so that doesn't mean that crowdfunding doesn't have its place, but it's just something that you're dealing with a very different beast. Sometimes people think that crowdfunding is easy. Anyone who's done crowdfunding will realize the amount of marketing and effort you have to do and the number of interactions and the people you have to hire. It really is definitely not, definitely no easier than if you're going to do like a, a seed fund, for instance. I think it, it's also very important to point out there as well is that with the more or less all uh, crowdfunding um, companies, they'll require a certain amount of funding raised already towards your goal. Um, the reason they do that is very simple. They might say it's 50% we need or 60%. So if you're raising, you know, 200 grand, we need a, a, you know, to know that you've already raised 100. Because what they'll then do is put it on the site saying 50% raised already. Then it pops up as um, an exciting opportunity. People think, right, it's already got investors, which is fair enough. Right, I'll put my 10, 20, 30 quid into, into that or whatever it might be. Um, but the, it's getting that initial... For example, unless you're ex exceptional and you're about to know the, you know, one of the bosses of the company, crowdfunding companies or platforms, um, you know, to to go to them without having raised any capital at all. Yeah, yeah. we had a company attended our event. Oh, where are we now? 
it would have been about February, March this year, a virtual one. Uh, they raised some money. They were seeking something in the region of about, I think it was just under a million. Um, they raised some capital and then they went on to um, seed, uh, seed seeders uh, and they're 150% overfunded. So there, it does, it, you know, it does work. But again, it's, um, it's not for everybody. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Thank you. Or you can um, employ companies like me, mine, which is what they do, is help, is help raise it, with secure investment for startups like you. We've been, been working yeah. for 20 years now. I think it'd be great if you two can hook up, yeah? Yeah. yeah I'll send, put my details in the post, in, 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 in the chat, sorry. Yeah, great. Thanks. That's great. Thanks, sorry. Anybody got any other questions? Uh, we just have a general chat, really. <laughs> Sean. Hi, uh, yes. Um, so just on the comment about uh, kind of crowdfunding, um, I mean, I'm looking at literally uh, seed funding in early stage, or angel funding in super early stage, just to get it into the feed. So and what you're saying is, I need to get funding to get onto that platform to get more funding uh, on the on uh, on the crowdfunding route, yes. Yeah. Right. So basically, for me, it's not really worth going that route then. No, I wouldn't waste time at the moment. Okay. And because the first question they'll ask you is what you're raising and how much you've raised so far, and if you say I'm raising a hundred, it doesn't matter what it is. You haven't raised anything so far. They'll say come back when you have. All oh, right. Okay. Yeah. It's not. You know. It's not a solution uh, from scratch, if that makes sense. Oh yeah, I see, okay. So would you say, which is the best route for me then? You're gonna be, uh, as I say, probably back towards where, what I was talking to Saru about is that you wanna be attending our events, for example, talking to people like Dan, um, influencers, mentors who can help, um, put well, the word out. Sorry, really so about 200, 200k. 200k. Mm. Right. Okay. And for, do you know how much for? Have you raised anything yet, Sean? Sure. No, nothing. Nothing. I've, I've just got a pitch deck. A co I mean, concept based though. Right. Um, and so that will be for me to get a uh, development uh, engineer so I can build up MVP um, and get kind of get a runway so I can. Uh, I've got potential clients in the pipeline that will, will use the product um, and, I, and that to build the MVP for the um, getting to a beta phase and build traction. Um, send me the, send me your pitch deck, Sean. Okay. I'll put my, my, um, my emails in the chat already. Fantastic. Okay. Um, uh, there are investors who will invest at concept stage, not as many. But there are some, if the idea is big enough, bold enough. Yeah, that's right. Okay. And also if you've got customers of some sort of lined up. Yes. I've spoken to my my uh, my market uh, at potential customers, and they were very interested in this product because it helps them to save time um, and, and effort with their, with their clients directly. So, um, what my clients will be one their clients will be they'll have uh, you know 20 or 50 clients base which will add coming to my platform uh, i've just got a thought um uh, sean i mean have you thought about doing enchanters in terms of having as we were talking earlier in terms of having an additional amount whether it's 50k or whatever and then kind of asking for more money Exactly. Well, that you know, my reaching, I kind of reach for uh, the moon, and get the stars. Uh, Sonora is more is based on if I can get aim for two hundred and I get fifty, it will allow me still to get an MVP product up and running, and then build the traction. So it kind of that's what I'm aiming for. I'll be happy with fifty. Okay. So yeah. Uh, thank you very much. I'll uh, send my details as soon as possible now. Yeah, great. I, I know we've had some contact, but um, yeah, please do. And then um, we can start 
looking at sort of various options between Dan and myself and, and, and such like. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Be Thanks a lot. Thank you. Anybody else want to comment? Do Dan, do you want to say anything else at the moment or? We're... Um, going, um, if there's any questions, I can take them. Sure. Uh, I'll just ask something. I mean, are you seeing any kind of trends in terms of what kind of uh, market, what kind of um, startups are, are easily, more easily attracting funds yeah. than others, given COVID, given where we are with the markets, et cetera, et cetera? Um, security is doing rather well, is, is one of the ones that's doing very well at the moment. Um, that's on the uh, back in vogue again, always tends to go around. Um, biotech and um, medtech yeah. um, is getting lots of funding and there's grants also available. Same goes with uh, with uh, batteries, battery technologies and stuff, some of them in the deep tech space as well. Um, we're just starting, the, the, just starting to see some startups in retail make a bit of a recovery they that got that got hit very badly in, uh, in covid now we're starting to see um, some of the uh, retails um, i call it a, a rebound not do not necessarily do very well not compared to in terms of it doing very well you've, you've got the fintech ones particularly the alternative fintech and payment fintechs which are doing very well the payment uh, the securities ones and the um, and the biotech ones as well. In, they're, they're the kind of booming. As a, so yeah, as things like retail and uh, hospitality is making a rebound after a, uh, after a bad time during COVID. Seems to be a lot. There seems to be a lot of dating companies raising capital as well at the moment. <laughs> Probably yeah. after everybody's not been together for so long. Oh well, everyone's been there, yeah, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there's some dating. Hey. Okay, so just to reiterate, it's, uh, we've got a pitch event coming up on uh, next week on the 27th at six in the evening. Um, if you go to our website, which is www.exponential events. In person, or is that face to face, or is that virtually? No, it's a virtual one. Right. Um, dot com, sorry, is the thing. At the top of the page is a link to our Eventbrite site where you've got tickets and, and such like. And I'll, I'll send a copy of the, all the information to everybody who's on. Um, on the on the physical side of it, <laughs> I mean, we're ready to go. We're going to start doing, and this probably sort of come um, back to how to meet investors and such like. We're going to do simple networking events linked to investors, uh, perhaps with a founder or two um, on board just to give a pitch. Not a full pitch event, but more of a relaxed networking um, type event. We're going to do a founders. Uh, meet founders event as well because a lot of uh, we've had a lot of requests from founders to meet other founders to discuss problems they have meeting people how they've overcome certain things uh, and such like and it's not you know also perhaps share networks because if you've got a founder invested in your business it's not necessarily not going to invest uh, in your business if he if you introduce him to somebody else who he invests in yeah, unless they're direct competition and that one's much better than yours. But I mean, that's not going to happen. Um, so we're going to be doing those hopefully starting in August or towards the end of August. And again, probably not where we were holding our pitch events, but more like a city London uh, venue where we can spread out a little bit more uh, because obviously some people or a lot of people are still very wary of uh, this lifting of restrictions and such like. So put it this way, I mean, Dan knows what it was like when we used to do our events at the Brand Exchange, which is just around the corner from the Bank of England. We'd take the club over for the night, we'd give us the bar and the lounge area downstairs, we'd have the upstairs theatre area. We'd pack a hundred plus people into, into, the, into the Brand Exchange. And anybody who knows that, uh, it, it's, you know, there's certainly no social distancing. Um, but yeah. So please have a look at our website and feel free to get in touch. As I say, we're here to help. 
your, your face-to-face events, so, I mean, that one that you just gave an example of with um, you know, like 100 people, you, you charge, what, 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 how does it work? Uh, we normally, well, in the past, what we've done is we've charged a nominal fee to people to come along and attend, i.e. potential investors and networkers. So normally about 25 quid. Um, depending on where we were, you might get a drink out of that type concept. Uh, because obviously, the difference between obviously virtual events and physical events is that we've got to hire the venue. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, unfortunately, that costs a lot of money. Uh, and then we charge the companies to pitch as well. Yep. We'd normally have 10 companies pitching, five minute pitch, boom, network. The great advantage of the, of the physical over the virtual is that, you know, I could say to you, Saru, oh, you've got to meet Dan because I know he knows somebody who's interested in investing in something like that, right? Um, yeah. And it's direct networking, whereas obviously the advantage with the virtual one is it's a lot cheaper. Uh, we can hold them more often. And also the audience is wider because they don't have to be in London. Yeah. They, don't, yeah. they don't even need to be in the UK, providing they're on a relatively similar sort of time uh, time zone. Sure. Yeah. So we're going forward, just to just let you know, we're gonna we're gonna run a hybrid, we're gonna run virtual, we're gonna run physical. Um, going forward. Great. Yeah. Uh, and also, again, with networks, give you an idea. My business partner is based in Dubai. He's been there twenty years. Uh, my my background's Asia. I'm normally in Asia. Haven't been for a while, but we'll be again Hong Kong, Singapore, KL. So we've got a lot of cross reference investors as well. It's not just a UK based concept. That's enough from me. That's very useful for my side because I'm based in uh, Portugal at the moment. So, okay, a virtual basis would be quite handy. Yeah, I mean, they are. We still get about 70, 80 people attend the virtuals. Um, bear in mind there that you know that this is more it's more of a we tell them it, it you know it is a pitch event you can sort of talk around with like we're chatting now afterwards um, but it is designed more at uh, investors looking at opportunities yeah okay. even with even so with the practice pitch we've got a number of because we've been doing it so long in the city now we know a number of funds we know a number of investors we know people from blackrock all that sort of stuff um they're starting to attend our um actual virtual uh it's not virtual pitch, we're like virtual practice your pitch events yeah so they want to see if there's any interest coming onto the market before it hits the market yeah, yeah. look ahead because um, you've got to look at it the other way around and put the investor's head on for a minute you don't want to be involved with everybody mm. yeah once you get to, you want to you want to find that thing that's uh, you're going to take off before yeah. anybody else gets into it mm-hmm. yeah Um, you know, it's like buy when everybody's selling. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Sure. Right, Dan, thanks very much. Uh, I know Dan's gone and Nancy's gone, but uh, this is being recorded. I'll send you an email link to our uh, YouTube channel. If you subscribe to that, then there's other ones on there as well. So you can have a look through and hopefully pick up some information. Plus there's some, uh, there's some videos of our actual old physical events on there as well. I'll give you an idea of what it, what it used to be and what we're gonna be doing again soon. Okay. If, if you wanna reach out, Sarab, Sean, you know what my details just do. Otherwise, uh, look forward to hearing you in the next one. Yeah. Dan, thanks very much. And everybody, oh no, nice to see you. I'll see you next week, yeah. Yes, see you next week. Okay. Right. Have a good day, everybody. Thanks for coming.